Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of Vietnam. In the previous lectures, we've been talking about the anti-war movement from a number of different perspectives. In this final lecture in the series, we'll talk about how the war was portrayed in popular culture and some of the ways that the anti-war movement crept into that culture. By the mid-1960s, popular support among the American people for the war was beginning to erode. Not everyone was active in the protest movement, but many at least began questioning the direction of the war. The malaise of this era was reflected in popular culture of the time as well. In the mid-1960s, pro-war books, films, and television shows were all quite popular. But doubts about the war by the mid to late 1960s began to eliminate those programs and even led to some anti-war popular culture beginning to take the scene. By 1966, popular programs like Convoy, McHale's Navy, and Wackiest Ship in the Army were gone, with Combat and 12 O'Clock High pulled the next season. By 1968, only Gomer Pyle and Hogan's heroes remained. As the 60s went on, anti-war themes became more apparent. A popular program called Daniel Boone, representing the revolutionary era, was written by anti-war activists and intentionally laden with anti-Vietnam themes by depicting the colonials as the Viet Cong and the English as the Americans. Also, Star Trek, which was popular at that time, aired storylines opposed to war and opposed to imperialism. Captains aren't supposed to interfere with internal affairs in another country or another world or planet. Other cases were not so subtle. The Smothers Brothers were a popular singing and comedy team, wildly popular in the late 1960s. By the late 60s, they had their own weekly variety show, aired on Sunday nights. They invited anti-war folk singers like Pete Seeger and Joan Baez to perform, struggling against censors who blocked out portions of the performances. Though their ratings were high, they were canceled by CBS in 1969 due to the repeated controversies and their unwillingness to compromise and change. Anti-war themes were also popular in the novels of the time. In 1967 and 68, numerous war novels were released, almost all of them emphasizing the confusion and atrocities of war and questioning the purpose of war. Even comic books reflected the anti-war movement. Jungle War, a popular comic for many years, was pulled in 1966 and the cartoon Tales of the Green Beret was dropped from newspapers in 1967. In other cases, the storylines of popular comics changed, as in 1968, when Marvel Comics hero Iron Man shifted from Cold War and Vietnam themes to race relations and crime fighting on the home front. One example of the shift in popular thinking is a book and film called The Green Book. The novel was first published by Robin Moore in 1965. It depicted the Green Berets as heroes, battling against the communists and struggling to prevent the international dominoes from falling. It was a bestseller and hailed as a great success. John Wayne bought the rights to The Green Berets in 1965 and set about making it into a film. Wayne actively supported the war effort and wanted to make a propaganda film in support of it. In filming, he had the support of the Johnson administration, which offered access to military bases and equipment. The resulting film port faithfully portrays the government line. One subplot involves the awakening of a, quote, liberal journalist, who begins the film as an anti-war skeptic. After following the activities of the Green Berets in the field, the journalist sees the light and comes to support the war effort. In the film, 
Acts of heroism are always taken by the American forces. Acts of torture and atrocities are only carried out by the enemy. American troops always seem to be outnumbered and fight valiantly against long odds. In the end, the film suggests that the true fight in Vietnam is not necessarily against the North Vietnamese, but against the liberal establishment that threatened to erode support back home. By the time the film was released in the summer of 1968, the mood of the public had shifted. The government line was no longer believed, and most Americans questioned the nature of the war. The film was widely panned in the press. A New York Times review wrote, The Green Berets is a film so unspeakable, so stupid, so rotten and false, that it passes through being fun, through being funny, through being camp, through everything, and becomes an invitation to grieve. Not for our soldiers in Vietnam, or for Vietnam. The film could not be more false or do a greater disservice to either of them. But for what has happened to the fantasy-making apparatus. Simplicities of the right, simplicities of the left. But this one is beyond the possible. It is vile and insane. Even trade journals criticized the film. The Hollywood Reporter called it a cliché-ridden throwback to the battlefield potboilers of World War II, its artifice readily exposed by the nightly actuality of TV news coverage. Had the film been released six months sooner, it might have been a popular hit. But in the aftermath of Tet, it completely missed the mark on popular sentiment at that time. By the summer of 1967, polls indicated that less than 50% of Americans supported the war for the first time, and support was falling fast. By October 1967, Lyndon Johnson's approval rating was only at 28%. At the end of that month, more than 100,000 people gathered in Washington to protest the war. But as I've described, there were many varieties of anti-war belief. Some were pacifists, opposed to all war on moral grounds. Others believed the war was detracting from other positive movements at home, like the civil rights movement and the war on poverty. Others opposed the war because they thought it was simply unwinnable. Others because they were thought to be backing a corrupt regime in the Johnson administration. Others because the war was unrelated to American national security. And many argued some combination of several of the arguments just listed. In our next lectures, we'll talk about the Johnson administration and its rapid decline, and then we'll move into the Nixon years and talk about how Nixon attempted to continue waging the war, despite the fact that the American public had turned against it.